Is it a aid package or is it a transaction where the United States is benefiting more than Israel? You're listening to the Tribecast at tribejournal.org. Welcome back to another episode of the Tribecast. We're here with former ambassador Yoram Edinger. For 10 years, I established and headed a Middle East research unit in the Israeli civil service. I served later on as uh, Israel's consul general to the southwestern states based in Houston, Texas. Uh, I came back to Israel as the head of the government press office dealing with foreign media in Israel, and then was sent back to the U.S. Uh, to the Israeli embassy in Washington, and I was in charge of our relations with the U.S. Uh, Congress. Uh, since uh, the beginning of 1993, I have been a retiree of the Israeli civil service, uh, dealing with U.S.-Israel relations and Middle East issues on my own as a private person, uh, issuing uh, the Ettinger report on a weekly uh, basis, uh, producing uh, short uh, videos, visiting the U.S. three to five times uh, a year, and uh, being a regular uh, commentator on uh, Israeli American uh, media, sharing with uh, people my uh, view of what's in it for America uh, rather than what's in it for uh, Israel, and try to base it on facts rather than on speculations. Let's jump right in, um, because that is a subject that is so fascinating to me. You know, recently in Congress, there was a packaged deal for the aid to foreign countries such as the Ukraine, Israel, and, uh, the, and to deal with the southern border. And it struck me as very odd that Israel would be bucketed with any country in a package. Of course, there's local domestic politics to the United States, but to bucket the Ukrainian plight with the Israeli relationship in one bill was a optical, almost nightmare. Um, to say that they're somehow even close to equivalent, uh, never mind the large sum of money that went to the Ukrainians, but the relationship that Israel and the United States has, it seems more transactional than a handout. And what I'd love to hear from you, and maybe we can deep dive on that today, is your perspective um, and the stats and the facts. Is it a aid package or is it a transaction where the United States is benefiting arguably right. more than Israel. There is a conventional uh, misperception about U.S.-Israel relations. Supposedly, those relations are based on U.S. foreign aid to Israel. Uh, the reality, however, is that Israel does not get foreign aid from the United States. The U.S. makes an annual investment in uh, Israel. And the question is, uh, how high or low is the ROI, the return on uh, investment? And when you examine the return on investment, you find out that the American taxpayer gets a few hundred percent of return on that investment year in and year out. Namely, not only isn't it at the expense of American taxpayer, it greatly benefits the American taxpayer. And this has to do with the defense issues or defense products, as well as commercial products. Uh, one example, is the U.S. Uh, combat aircraft, uh, which it supplies to Israel. So obviously, uh, Israel is immensely, immensely grateful for those planes. But in return for those planes, we share with the U.S. litany of lessons. I learned about it when I visited the plant in Fort Worth, uh, Texas, which manufactures the F-16 and the F-35 combat uh, aircraft. 
And one of the plant manager mentioned to me that the F-16 alone has over 600 modifications as a result of the Israeli lesson. According to that plant manager, Israel has been the most effective battle-tested laboratory for the plant. Namely, Israel, the Israeli Air Force gets those planes, again, in, uh, with uh, much, much uh, gratitude. However, we don't get it for parades. We don't get it in order to store it. Upon receiving it, we right away start using it operationally because of the challenges uh, around uh, Israel. Every single day, according to the plant manager, the plant receives from the Israeli Air Force lessons. For instance, the cockpit of the F-16 is 50% upgraded as a result of the Israeli lesson. The firing control is 75% upgraded as a result of the Israeli lessons, and those lessons are operational, maintenance, uh, and repairs. And again, according to the plant manager, those uh, lessons save the plant anywhere between 10 and 20 years of research and development, which worth what he uh, referred to mega billion dollar bonanza to the manufacturer. When I asked him, uh, what do you mean uh, mega billion? How do you reach such an imaginary uh, figure? And his response was, anybody who knows anything about the cost of research and development of combat aircraft would know that sparing the plan 10 to 20 years of R&D, research and development, amounts to many, many billions of dollars. But that's only the beginning of the contribution to the plant, because uh, the fact that the, plant, the plane is immensely upgraded as a result of the Israeli experience has enhanced the competitiveness of the plane in the global market. And once the competition uh, takes uh, effect, it increases the export of the plane, which contributes to the plant few more billions of, uh, of dollars. Moreover, as he told me, the fact that Israel flies the F-16 and F-35 right away sends a message to the uh, global market that if Israel flies it, it must be the best because Israel needs the best in order to meet its uh, challenges. The bottom line is that Israel has become a unique dollar and force multiplier for the U.S. defense industry, U.S aerospace industry, which employs something like three and a half million people, and then come the few million subcontractors or people employed by the subcontractors of the defense uh, industry. The F-35, by the way, is much more expensive, much more sophisticated than the F-16, which means the value added to the plant by Israel using the F-35 is even higher than the mega billion bonanza rendered to the plant by uh, the Israeli battle-tested uh, uh, laboratory. Uh, Israel employs a few hundred American military systems. Each one we use operationally. Each one yields lessons to the Israeli user, which we share right away with the manufacturer because we want to get better product next time. It yields benefits to Israel as well as to the American uh, manufacturer. Uh, that's only one part of the contributions by Israel to the U.S. Uh, economy, because we also share those lessons with the American Air Force. And those lessons have uh, improved dramatically the U.S. Air Force battle tactics. It has improved dramatically the U.S. Air Force training 
program. Now we do the same thing for the infantry, for the ground forces. We do the same thing for missile uh, batteries. Because once again, we are the battle-tested laboratory for each American military system which we employ, which we use. And by the way, we generally use the combat aircraft and the missile launchers and the missile and the tanks a few years before Americans get to use it operationally. But by the time the American pilots uh, fly the F-35 or F-16 or F-15 operationally, they do it with the added value of the Israeli experience, I, I, which has spared many, many American lives. Fortune magazine reported the Lockheed Martin's $1.7 trillion F-35 fighter jet is 10 years late and 80% over budget. It could be one of the Pentagon's biggest success stories. On a $1.7 trillion you know, spend just to produce the first plane, um, how do we measure the, the upgrade that Israel contributed? And then secondly, why would they develop that and then give that to Israel as opposed to using it themselves? Like, why wouldn't the American Air Force, the United States Air Force, benefit, be the first beneficiary of a $1.7 trillion spend? Well, obviously, the American Air Force is the first one to use the F-35. But the challenges facing the U.S. are dwarfed by the military challenges facing Israel. Uh, and okay, so just to qualify what you said before, Israel will put it in battle. I mean, it's, it's using it in battle, are, whereas the United are, States might not have used it in battle first. We, we is that, is battle, that what We are a battle-tested laboratory. The difference between average American combat pilot and average Israeli combat pilot is that the Israeli combat pilot from day one, from day one, is flying uh, under do or die state of mind. Uh, this state of mind is rarely, rarely felt by American pilots because very, very few American pilots experience dogfights. Every oh, single uh, meaning Israeli, Afghanistan didn't really have F-16s to compete. They were, uh, they were it was a ground it's, battle. It's very rare. It's very rare, and and uh, therefore, by the way, therefore, uh, the uh, is American Air Force is eager to conduct joint exercises with the Israeli Air Force. And as I was told by a number of American combat uh, uh, aircraft uh, pilots, that the most effective time in their service in the American uh, Air Force is joint maneuver, joint exercise with the Israeli Air Force. And that's when they find out how really good is the American F-15 or F-16 or F-35. And the reason is that the Israeli pilots have to maneuver the plane much more audaciously and much more innovatingly if they want to survive dogfights, if they want to survive the incoming ground-to-air uh, missiles. Give you an example, 1982. Uh, Israel conducted a war against Palestinian terrorists in Lebanon. A major challenge for Israel during that war were 20 ground-to-air Soviet missile batteries, which were stationed in the Lebanese valley between Lebanon and Israel. Israel had to take on those batteries in order to conduct safe battle against Palestinian uh, terrorists. At that time in 1982, the Americans perceived those batteries impossible to penetrate. But Israel had to penetrate it. We had no choice. And we found a way to penetrate it. I met uh, two and a half weeks ago in Washington, D.C., during uh, my visit there, I met a retired Brigadier General, Air Force Brigadier General, who mentioned to me that the lessons of that battle, which uh, Israel conducted successfully, destroying all 20 Soviet ground-to-air batteries, in the process, 
downing 80 Soviet MiG combat fighter planes without using, without losing a single uh, plane of, uh, of the Israeli Air Force. That battle, according to the retired Brigadier General, has changed completely the battle tactics of the American Air Force has transformed completely the training program for the American Air Force. And that has been the result of Israel sharing with the American Air Force the lessons of that uh, battle. We do the same thing with urban uh, warfare. Uh, in On uh, February 14th, the FBI director Chris uh, Ray came to Israel to visit Israel. He met the top echelon of the Israeli Secret Service, of the Israeli uh, intelligence community, and of the Israeli police, learning how does Israel fight the urban warfare in Gaza, because according to the FBI director, very reliable intelligence sources suggest that the Hamas war on Israel has inspired number of anti-U.S. Islamic terror organizations to conduct similar terror operations against Americans in the Middle East and in the American homeland uh, itself. In fact, the FBI director repeated uh, that uh, fact when he testified in November at the House Committee on Homeland Security and only a few days ago in the Senate Homeland Security uh, Committee. Uh, you have in, in Alabama a base, a military base specializing in urban warfare. They train via a model on the base which was built for them by Israeli experts in urban warfare based on Israeli war uh, battle experience in Lebanon, Judea, Samaria, and uh, Gaza. Once a year, some 50 urban warfare military experts come to Israel to get the latest update from the Israeli uh, experts. Uh, is American special operations on the way to Afghanistan until recently and on the way to Iraq uh, currently, they usually go through Israel, where they get two-week training by top Israeli experts on facing uh, car bombs, suicide bombers, and the deadly improvised explosive devices. And I heard from a commander of Special Operation Battalion that concluded a year of service in Iraq. According to the commander of that uh, Special Operation Battalion, much of the credit to the fact that the battalion came back to the U.S. without a single fatality is due to those two-week training in Israel. I asked him, a very naive question. Do you mean that there was a real substantial added value to those two weeks in Israel? And his response was that he is the commander of one of the top special operations battalion in the U.S. He spends much of the year traveling around the world, training special operation forces of U.S. allies. But according to him, there's only one country where he does not train, but am trained. That's Israel. And that's the added value that Israel renders the United States. Uh, you can also talk about the, uh, the battle-tested uh, laboratory named Israel and its contribution to the U.S. You can talk about it in the context of intelligence. Israel provides the U.S. more intelligence than all NATO countries combined. In fact, a former chief of the Air Force Intelligence, General George Keegan, testified in Congress and was, when he was asked, why are you so enthusiastic about collaboration with the Israeli intelligence authorities? 
His response was, if the U.S. were to procure on its own the intelligence that it receives from Israel, then the U.S. would have to establish five CIAs. And I always say, let's assume he exaggerated. It's not five CIAs. It's not even two CIAs. It's only one CIA. The annual budget of one CIA is almost $15 billion. That by itself represents a 450% added value or return on investment of the $3.8 billion annual investment, which erroneously, erroneously is misperceived as if it is foreign aid handout. It's not handout, it's not foreign aid, it's a very successful investment. Former Secretary of State and Supreme Commander of uh, NATO, uh, General Alexander Haig, used to refer to Israel as the largest American aircraft carrier, which does not require a single American on board, which cannot be sunk, and is deployed in the most critical region of the world between Europe and Asia and Africa, between the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean, and the Persian Gulf, a most critical area for the fight against American uh, or anti-American Islamic terrorism, most critical area for global trade, most critical area for the exportation of oil and natural gas. And according to the late General Alexander Haig, if there would not be Israel in the Middle East, then the U.S. to protect its own interests would have to manufacture and deploy to the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean, few more real aircraft carriers, in addition to a few more ground uh, divisions, all of which would have cost the American taxpayer anywhere between 15 and $20 billion annually. That represents over 500% return on investment. So when you add the battle-tested laboratory, the, uh, the source of unique intelligence, and the benefits by merely existing in the Middle East and extending the strategic arm of the U.S. without a need for a single additional American soldier, you get year in and year out a return on investment of many, many hundreds of percent on the $3.8 billion. It's not a one-way street, it's a two-way street, which is mutually beneficial to the U.S. and Israel. Very interesting. Thank you for that, that uh, overview, because when we talk about the F-16 cockpit being upgraded by 50% and the F-35 by 75%, it seems a little bit insignificant compared to all of the other um, contributions and partnerships that the Israeli military has with the United States military. Well, it's, it's not limited only to um, defense or military-related uh, uh, topics. Uh, it also has to do with commercial. Uh, only recently, about uh, two and a half months ago, the CEO of Intel announced an added investment in Israel of $25 billion invested in Intel's research and development and manufacturing facilities. The investment is not driven by low cost uh, work in Israel. High tech in Israel is a very high cost uh, uh, branch of the Israeli economy. The investment in Israel is made because of the brain power of Israel, which has benefited not only Intel. There are some 250 American high tech giants establishing research and development centers in Israel in order to leverage the brain power of Israel. Recently, the CEO of Microsoft told the board of directors that by the day Microsoft becomes increasingly an Israeli company due to the impact 
of its own research and development centers in Israel upon Microsoft uh, products. And we're talking about uh, medical tech, uh, biotech, uh, uh, financial uh, tech. We're talking about the Facebook of the world, the Google of the world, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to focus on the military today because that's, for me, that's the topic of interest. I've been reading up on it and trying to make sense of everything that's going on in the world, <clears throat> geopolitically and also local to Israel. Um, I mean, just as you were speaking, I, I, I should have really taken notes of all my questions, but I don't think we'd be able to clear every question today. Maybe we can meet another time in the future. But, um, you know, there's, there are companies, you know, it's almost like uh, this is the sandbox in which the United States government is able to not only develop indirectly through Israel's innovation, but test a lot of the equipment that they may develop. And um, it puts us in a pretty strange position, I would say. I mean, as someone who lives here now and, and uh, is, you know, within earshot of the bombs that were, you know, going off in uh, Gaza and, you know, my building was shaking and uh, anyone an hour away, you're talking Tel Aviv, <laughs> Tel Aviv is an hour away from Gaza, Jerusalem is an hour away from Gaza by motorcycle. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it begs the question, that without the war in the Middle East, what would the United States military do? I mean, there's so much innovation. I'm not saying there would be, with an $800 billion spend annually, I'm sure they would figure something else to do, right? But the innovation that comes out through the affliction of the Jewish people, of, of the uh, Arab neighbors through the war, right? The whole region is in flames. Um, and so my question, I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, you know, without deep diving on, again, we, we could spend days talking about, you know, just like going through the, the overview there, but what are your thoughts in terms of just, you know, jumping off from that general uh, overview into this war that we're in and watching the, uh, I think the Israeli military is, correct me if I'm wrong, 20% funded by uh, the United States. Is that correct? All of the maneuvering that happened between the current administration in the United States uh, number one, removing the stockpile, sending it over to the Ukraine, leaving Israel a little bit high and dry, um, but then also leveraging that power, you know, of having a 20% say in, um, in rearming uh, Israel after a intense, you know, five months now. Um, that whole relationship seems a little bit strained, uh, at least from the administration there and the administration here, with all of the overlapping um, of the companies that produce these arms, the relationships there that are very deep relationships, um, it seems like there, there is bound to be some level of conflict of interest, uh, conflict of interest in the sense that, you know, without the war, the sandbox goes away. So if this is the golden goose that keeps producing things like the Iron Dome, which is deploying soon and testing the iron beam in real time. Um, if this is the golden goose, then, you know, it sounds like a crazy idea, but is that a conflict of interest? Like, does the United States have any interest in stopping the war here if they benefit so significantly, like you just mentioned? Well, the, the, the wars in this area, uh, those involving Israel and those that do not involve uh, Israel uh, has uh, nothing to do with the uh, US. Uh, the Middle East has been conflict ridden since the seventh century when Islam appeared on the face of this earth. Since the appearance of Islam until today, there hasn't been yet intra-Muslim peaceful coexistence. There hasn't been yet intra-Arab peaceful coexistence, and it doesn't matter who is the tenant in the White House or who is the Prime Minister of Israel. Those wars are independent of the West, independent of the US. They have to do with the nature of the neighborhood. They have to do with the culture of the neighborhood. They have to do with the ideology of the neighborhood. They have to do with the fact uh, 
that some uh, very radical, powerful element in the Middle East are driven by very fanatic religious Islamic uh, ideology. And they are uh, determined, they are determined to uh, uh, defeat every what they call apostate, namely a Muslim who does not believe in their own Muslim persuasion. So the Shiites are determined to topple every Sunni Arab regime, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Jordan, Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, uh, etc. Uh, they are determined then to bring the Western so-called infidel to submission. And they are determined to focus on what they call the great American Satan. This has been the story of the Middle East again since the 7th century. This has been the story of the U.S. since independence. You go back to American history and you find out that since the beginning of the 19th century, the U.S. had to face Islamic terrorists. Those days, they were talking about the barbaries of uh, North uh, Africa who used to chase American uh, ships. But since then, Islamic terrorism has focused on the U.S. and it does not matter whether Obama is the president. You had the Fort Hood terrorism in Texas with 12 American um, uh, military men slaughtered by a Muslim terrorist. You had the San Bernardino uh, uh, terror, but you also had uh, the same thing uh, afflicting America during Trump's uh, time. Uh, this is very pertinent to note because when Israel fights Islamic terrorists such as Hamas in the south, Hezbollah in the north, true that we are fighting Israel's war, but we are the first line of defense of the United States and Western democracies because Hamas and Hezbollah are proxies of the Ayatollahs of Iran, whose number one target has never been Israel. The number one target has been the great American Satan. They are branches. The Hamas is a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood, which was, which was established in 1928, has always focused on the Western so-called infidel. So the Israeli war is serving very much homeland security in the U.S., national security of the U.S., in addition of serving as a battle-tested laboratory which enhances the capabilities of America to withstand the onslaught by different Muslim elements uh, coming from the Middle East. Fair enough, but if we, if we bring it a little bit more local to the current conflict, it makes no sense what's happening. I mean, to, to Israel is at war, is a defensive war against the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, and the Yehud of Hashem in the West Bank, Gaza, clearly. There, there is a ongoing, decades-long, I mean, since the inception of the State of Israel, but uh, very intensely in, in the past two decades, uh, and it seems that the United States is not only in, f in favor of a Palestinian Authority run uh, two-state solution still, but they're arming them. Well, uh, here one needs, needs to distinguish between the State Department and, for instance, the armed services of the U.S. or the intelligence uh, agencies of the U.S. The State Department uh, has embraced the idea of a Palestinian state for decades. But the State Department has a track record, and that track record in the Middle East is a failed track record with many exclamation marks. It was the State Department that opposed the establishment of a Jewish state because according to the State Department, that Jewish state was destined to be an ally of the Soviet bloc. And how wrong uh, were they? The State Department assumed that the Jewish state 
would not be able to withstand an all-out Arab military assault. And how wrong was the State Department? The State Department led the policy which embraced Ayatollah Khomeini back in 1978-79 and stabbed the back of the Shah of Iran, who was the American policeman of the Gulf. It was the State Department and obviously the White House that provided the tailwind for the Ayatollahs to topple the Shah and take over Iran, transforming Iran from the number one strategic ally of the U.S. in the Middle East to the most venomous octopus haunting the U.S all over the world and increasingly also on the U.S.-Mexico uh, border. It was the State Department that led the policy which considers Saddam Hussein to be an ally of the U.S. And therefore, Saddam Hussein was a privy to joint intelligence agreements with the U.S. And that policy lasted literally until the day of the invasion of Kuwait back in August of 1990. And in fact, only 10 days before the invasion, Saddam Hussein asked the U.S. ambassador to Baghdad, uh, April Gillespie, what would be the U.S. reaction if Iraq would use its military to return province 19. Province 19 is Kuwait, according to the Iraqi uh, policy. And the response by the ambassador as, as reflecting the State Department in Washington was, if you invade Kuwait, it's none of our business. It's an inter-Arab uh, issue. And there couldn't be a greener light for Saddam Hussein to invade Iraq, uh, Kuwait. And then he was dumbfounded. How could the U.S. attack him after they gave him a green light to invade Kuwait? It has been, it was the State Department which led the military offense or initiated the military offensive against Gaddafi in 2011. Gaddafi at that time was one of the foremost warriors against Islamic terrorism. He transferred his nuclear infrastructure to the U.S. It's in Tennessee until this very uh, day. But the State Department was upset with Gaddafi's the record of human rights because he mistreated, supposedly, Islamic terrorists in Libya. As a result of toppling uh, Gaddafi, Libya has been transformed into a platform of anti-US, anti-European Islamic terror organizations an arena of several civil wars with the involvement of Russia and Turkey and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab uh, Emirates, haunting Egypt, haunting Central Africa. And I could go on and on describing the errors made by the State Department. One of them is embracing the idea of a Palestinian state, which, by the way, not a single pro-American Arab country embraces. The Arabs, unlike the State Department, shower Palestinians with talk. They refrain from effective, tangible walk on behalf of Palestinian state. Their walk towards the Palestinian state is anywhere from indifferent to negative. And the reason is that while the State Department bases its uh, support of the idea of a Palestinian state on a speculative future scenario whereby two states living peacefully side by side, the Arabs are not that naive. The Arabs don't base their future policy on speculative scenarios. They base it on the track record 
of the Palestinian leadership and the track record has rendered the Palestinians to become the role model of intra-Arab subversion, intra-Arab terrorism and treachery. And the reason is because in the 1950s, the Palestinian leadership was allowed to terrorize Israel from Egypt-controlled Gaza, but within a year, the Palestinians joined the Muslim Brotherhood, terrorizing the central regime which hosted them. And the Palestinian leadership had to run away to Syria. Syria allowed them to terrorize Israel, but within a few years, they joined the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, terrorizing the sent their host regime. And they had to run away from Syria. Jordan accepted them allowing them to terrorize Israel. But after two years, in 1970, they decided to take on the central regime in Amman, Jordan, which triggered a civil war, Black September of 1970, and they had to run away to Lebanon, which they plundered for 12 years, along with number of civil wars, until they had to run away from uh, Lebanon, they were expelled from Lebanon. And in 1990, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, the Palestinians who were hosted by Kuwait, which was at that time the most generous Arab host of the Palestinians, the Palestinians joined Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, stabbing their host once again in the back. That was the reason that when the Kuwaiti leader, Sheikh Sabah, restored his regime, the first thing he did was expelling almost all 400,000 Palestinians from Kuwait. The Arabs don't forget and they don't forgive. And they have concluded that such a track record is a guarantee for another failed state, another rogue state, in the Middle East, which would threaten their own survival. They're also aware that the Palestinian leadership is very close to North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba, China, Russia. They know that the Palestinians uh, trained terrorists from Asia and Africa and Latin America, and therefore they embrace Palestinians with very loving talk, but the walk has been, again, indifferent to negative, unlike the State Department. Can you explain succinctly the difference, like the parties at play there? You got the State Department, you got the White House. It's very complex, but in a slightly different way. Uh, traditionally, the State Department sets, shapes foreign policy. Traditionally, there were four years of exception those were the four years of Trump when he literally evicted them from the arena of shaping foreign policy. And therefore, and therefore, we have achieved the four peace treaties with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco, with South, South Sudan, because that's, we... That's the Abra Abraham Accords? Or? Abraham Accords, because we did not follow the State Department focus on the Palestinian issue, we bypassed the Palestinian issue. Arabs are not willing to sacrifice their own interest on the altar of Palestinian interests. Now, currently, the State Department is back at the helm, and therefore the White House follows the State Department-shaped policy. Secretary Tony Blinken is the number one uh, uh, shaper of U.S. foreign policy and, in fact, also national security policy. He has been very close, intimately close with President Biden, going back to Biden's days in the Senate when uh, Secretary Blinken started his way as a junior staffer on the Senate Foreign Relations, rose to the number one position as staff director 
uh, of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations under Chairman uh, Senator Joe uh, Biden. And since then, he has been the number one confidant of President Biden. And in, uh, in the last three years, uh, as, as a Secretary of State, he has been not only the number one confidant, it has been Secretary Blinken who shaped the policy, who has navigated the White House and President uh, Biden. And Secretary Blinken worldview is basically a cosmopolitan worldview, just like the State Department. Secretary Blinken does not believe in an independent, unilateral U.S. national security action. Secretary Blinken believes in multilateralism, namely that the U.S. should act in concert with the anti-U.S. U.N., in concert with the Europeans who have lost their will to fight. I don't know if there is any muscle left in Europe. Secretary Blinken wants to work with international organization, and that has led him to the uh, appeasement policy towards Iran and the appeasement policy towards the Palestinians. Okay. I, as, as an interviewer, uh, I feel a little bit getting taken out into the deep waters there. It feels a little bit like I'm getting taken out into the deep waters, which is why I, I wanted to have more of a dialogue on that, but uh, because I, I'm more concerned with um, with the chessboard and the pieces of the chessboard, and you articulated that very, very interestingly, very nicely. Um, the idea that the State Department is actually uh, its own beast, we'll call it, and then the White House is its own beast, and and traditionally the White House follows the State Department on foreign policy. The Secretary of State yields a lot of power. And the president of the United States is the ultimate, uh, you know, policy maker. he's the policymaker. He's the, he's the chief executive of the military. And so um, but what you're saying is that sometimes the State Department, meaning not the secretary of state who's appointed, right? He's appointed by right. the president. Uh, so sometimes the, the, the State Department, which is made up of generals, which is made up of uh, undersecretaries. Are the undersecretaries also appointed by the elected president? Or are the undersecretaries there by way of, um, you know, promotion through the ranks they, of the they are, military? They are appointed by the, uh, by the president and approved by the Senate. Okay. By the Senate. Now, there what are a, exceptions. What about, what, what, what about um, the chiefs of staff? The Joint Chiefs of Staff, though th this is... That's different. That's military. That's strictly the State that's Department, a, that's right? That's the Pentagon. That's, that's the Pentagon. Pen that's a different uh, old. So together. what's the correlation? I mean, the state is in the Pentagon. You, the people who are the State Department are... They work at the Pentagon, right? Well, the, the, you have the, the, the Pentagon, which is in charge of the defense policy. You have the State Department, which is in charge of foreign policy. Unless you have a very powerful... Uh, Secretary of State, uh, such as uh, uh, Blinken, uh, again, who navigates foreign policy and to an extent national security I, policy. I, I, I want to keep it general just so we understand the positions and then we can talk about the people maybe. But but just, you know, I, I think for most people, this is all a blur. Most people don't. You're, you're, you're in Washington. How long were you in Washington for? No, I, I was there for three years. Okay, three years. But, but, since, but since I concluded my role and retired from the civil service, I've been visiting the U.S. three, five times uh, a year. Sure, and you, every visit, about a week. Right, you're familiar Washington. with all these, the roles that there are, all the positions on the team, right? If it's, in other words, we could talk about the, the Boston Celtics, right? We could talk about the different uh, basketball uh, players, you know, how great Bird was and and uh, Kevin McHale and the, the synergy that they had on the team. But I'm more concerned at this point, like what is, a, what is the role of a point guard? What is the role of a center? In general terms, you have the State Department, it's like Pentagon and State Department. What is that? Undersecretaries are appointed, and then you have the- no, you have undersecretaries in the State Department, and undersecretaries in the Pentagon, and undersecretaries in different- Okay, and they're all appointed by the president. portfolios. They're all appointed by the president, the elected president. By the president, but, but uh, when you have, uh, during Bush senior, uh, 
very powerful Secretary of State like Jim Baker, uh, Henry Kissinger, when he was National Security Advisor, he determined U.S. foreign policy, not the State Department. Uh, but again, without getting into each particular person, so wh what is that? Two different cabinet shops. Two so what does that mean? What is the Pentagon? The Pentagon what is the State Department? The Pent Pentagon oversees the national security uh, complex of the U.S. Uh, the State Department oversees the foreign policy complex. National Security Council is part of the White House. Within the White House, you have the National Security Advisor. The State Department is in charge of, of U.S. international relations. So that's more of a diplomatic yeah. office. Yeah. But they're not really um, making those decisions. It depends when you have... Uh, that's what you're saying uh, about these different, different Secretary secretaries. Blinken, yeah. who okay. is uh, more than just a Secretary of State and more than, than just confidant. Who runs the Pentagon? The Secretary of Defense, Austin. Okay, so the Pentagon General, is General the Secretary Austin, of Defense. Right. Secretary of State is dealing with more with right. the foreign policy. So you've been, you're harping on uh, Blinken, but what, what role does the State Department, uh, what the, sorry, the Pentagon have to do with, with policy? They're just saying well, they've taken a back seat to Blinken. St State Department takes a back seat whenever the Secretary of Defense is not as influential as is the Secretary of uh, State. So really, it's, it's, it's kind of a seesaw. It depends on who's in which positions. Absolutely. Absolutely. But again, those, what, are, what's those the, are different shops, independent shops. Well, well they, they are, but they're not. I mean, if, one, if, if it's a seesaw of power and influence, then they're really very much well, correlated. Because you have, you have the, the number one official is the president of the U.S. And if he is navigated, as is currently the case, if he is navigated by Secretary of State Blinken, then obviously that means that Blinken also influences national security, which is the shop of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Pentagon. The relationship with Israel, where do those decisions come from? Well, in other words, in other words to, to partner on the Iron Dome, for example. Here you bring in another element in the structure of uh, American gover governance, American government, and uh, America-U.S. relations with Israel, and that's the U.S. legislature. The U.S. legislature, House and the Senate, uh, is the strongest legislature anywhere in the world, and it's co-equal, co-equal, co-determining with the administration. There is a misperception that the president is uh, uh, he navigates alone U.S. policy. This is not the case. He navigates alone as long as Congress allows him to navigate it alone. But when Congress wanted to end the war in Vietnam, irrespective of Nixon's opposition, the war was over because Congress voted to end all funding by midnight of a certain uh, date. And it didn't matter what Nixon had in mind or what his Secretary of State had in mind. In uh, 2014, when President Obama uh, wanted to delay the funding or the, the replenishment of Iron Dome, which was essential for the war, which was conducted at that time in 2014, again, against Hamas in Gaza. Obama wanted to delay it and delay it in order to squeeze more concessions out of Israel. And it was the U.S. Senate that made it clear, Democrats and Republicans, on the Appropriations Committee, on the Armed Services Committee, who made it clear to President Obama, if you do not release the replenishment, namely sign on the congressional decision to replenish it, if you do not do it by the end of this day, you will not get any of your budget wishes. And within an hour, the message came from the White House, 
the, uh, the president has authorized replenishing uh, Iron Dome. Uh, during uh, Bush senior, uh, uh, who had very, very ugly relations with then Prime Minister Shamir of uh, Israel. The President and his Secretary of State opposed every single pro-Israel initiative on Capitol Hill. However, Congress, especially Senate, initiated a litany, a litany of amendments expanding U.S.-Israel strategic and commercial relations, benefiting both countries, almost 100% passed and acted, notwithstanding the very decisive, very brutal opposition by the Secretary of State and by the President, proving against, again, that Congress can call the shots on foreign policy, national security policy, if Congress wishes. And I say if, because members of the House are elected for one primary reason, to serve the interest of their district. And that has usually nothing to do with foreign policy and national security. Senators are elected to advance the interest of their own state. So senators and members of the House prefer to deal with district and state issues, not with foreign and not with national security, unless they decide that the president is not serving the best interest of the United States. When Obama courted the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt and facilitated their rise to power, Congress was not uh, enamored with that policy. And Congress decided to uh, levy sanctions against the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Obama opposed it, but sanctions were levied against the Muslim Brotherhood because Congress has the power of the purse, not the president. Congress uh, did not like Putin during Trump's time. Trump did not want sanctions on Putin, but Congress decided to uh, legislate sanctions against Putin, and sanctions were indeed legislated irrespective of Trump's opposition. So Congress has the power to restrict the maneuverability of presidents in the area of national security and foreign policy. Congress has the power to initiate its own policy, irrespective of the president. But in most cases, they prefer not to deal with those areas. This is super interesting. Talking about a $800 billion per year, and obviously there's an influence of corporate influence in, in Congress. It's less about the people's votes, it's more about the lobby establishment uh, influence in Congress. So uh, w what are your thoughts on that, just generally in terms of the military establishment being so large as it is, and their influence and interests in maintaining a, sup a superb uh, state-of-the-art military in the United States, and the, the how does that correlate with Israel's um, interests locally, and, and, and that's number one. And number two is, um, as Israel is faced with the dilemma of expanding its, its local production and exports, um, what, what are your thoughts on that in terms of Washington okay. intervening to, for example, Germany? There was a contract that was made public uh, about German, Germany importing Israeli exports, military exports, and reports came back that within like a day or less, yeah. <laughs> that was canceled because there was a, a phone call from the White House. There were some exports that were unnamed people now. And is that going to be, are we going to see more of that as Israel tries to build its own local production in order to survive? Well, legislators are accountable first and foremost to constituents. Corporations are very, very influential. But again, if they contradict the will of the constituents, the legislator will side with the constituents because otherwise the legislator would sign his own 
political death uh, uh, sentence. It has to be a. It, it has to be a one of those hot issues to the local community that elected him or her. That that if it's not such a hot issue, then they'll go with the party. If the party votes oftentimes in blocks, it's a top-down type of a thing in Congress. That that's well documented. Yeah, um, but only people are, are reluctant again. to go against the party in order to side with their constituents. Yeah. And we could we could get into that. It's not the topic for today. I just no. But, but again, uh, a legislator who goes against constituents. Uh, is doomed. And therefore, again, Senator Manchin from West Virginia uh, has been consistently a thorn in the back of uh, President uh, Biden. They are this, uh, in the same party, but uh, Senator Manchin knows that he's the only Democrat uh, uh, having a state office in West Virginia, and he must be very, very moderate, very, very close to the Republican state of mind if he wants to survive politically in West uh, Virginia. When it comes to the impact of uh, supply of American military hardware to Israel and its impact on the Israeli defense industry, uh, there's no doubt uh, it has had a major, major uh, impact and I would say a negative uh, impact. Uh, that's the reason myself, going back to uh, 1991, when I was at the Israeli embassy, uh, I have been of the opinion since 1991 that Israel must, must, for its own uh, interest, gradually phase out what is mistakenly called foreign aid. And it must do that for its own uh, sake, not only because it uh, would improve tremendously our, uh, our stature, uh, our public relation in the U.S., but also because it is the best thing for Israel's defense uh, industry. Uh, we have to phase it out over a number of years, let's say 10, uh, 10 years. But currently, we uh, employ American military systems, again, for which we are very, very grateful. But that means that we cannot buy similar Israeli military systems. Or uh, if we find somewhere in Britain or France or Sweden or who knows where, a system which fits better our needs than the American, we're still obligated to buy the American, uh, the American uh, system. In my mind, we should phase it out over 10 years, let's say the $3.8 billion, namely every year, $380 million phased out. However, we should phase it out uh, constructively, 500 million are dedicated to the development of ballistic uh, technologies. In addition to that, you have the replenishment of the Iron Dome, which is in addition, but that's part of the agreement. It was Israel which developed the Iron Dome, and we were assisted financially to an extent, not totally, by the U.S., and according to the agreement, much of the manufacturing is conducted on U.S. soil by Raytheon. But in return for that, the U.S. finances the replenishment of Iron Dome in, uh, uh, by, by Israel. But going back to the $3.8 billion, in my mind, it should be phased out over 10 years, every year. 380 million, not thrown to the basket, but every year, 10%, rather than being part of so-called foreign aid, that, that, that $380 million will be the foundation of another joint U.S.-Israel foundation designed to boost, to bolster, 
commercial cooperation between American companies and Israeli companies, which uh, have synergy between them or among uh, them. Uh, there is already a major such uh, fund uh, called BIRD, Binational Industrial Research and Development Fund. It was established back in 1975, providing uh, uh, ground for more uh, cooperation between U.S. high-tech companies and uh, young Israeli high-tech companies. It has been an extremely successful fund, was established initially by each country investing 75 million. Another 50 million was added during the, the years. But since 75 until today, the revenues of benefiting beneficial beneficiary companies, revenues have exceeded $8 billion. That's quite a return on investment of 75 or $150 million uh, going back to 75. What I would like to see is 10 more similar funds, but rather than BIRD, which encompasses all aspects of uh, high tech, uh, all aspects of uh, computer sciences, etc., there should be a fund, let's say, focusing on artificial intelligence, a fund focusing on, uh, on uh, cyber uh, security and eight other additional such uh, funds, establishing such sources of revenues for American and Israeli companies instead of uh, foreign aid. That, in my mind, will expand cooperation between the two countries. It will create many, many uh, more jobs in the U.S. and in Israel, and it will enable the Israeli defense uh, uh, industry to, uh, act to sell its products to uh, Israeli companies. Ambassador Yoram Edinger, we really appreciate your time today. Thank you. And sharing your, your career of deep knowledge, insights, and wisdom with us. I hope we can continue this conversation another Absolutely. time. I know your time is pressed and we really appreciate you making the time. God bless. Only good things. Bez Hashem, we should see peace in our days. At Tribe Journal, we tell the untold. You can find more great content like this at tribejournal.org. Thanks for being with us.